Welcome back, everyone. This is the eighth episode in the series, Tales of TR, offered by the Theodore Roosevelt Institute of Long Island University. Our speaker is Tweed Roosevelt, the great grandson of the 26th president of the United States and chairman of the newly formed Roosevelt School, which opens in fall 2021 at Long Island University. Today's episode is titled, TR, the making of a leader. We invite you to watch previous episodes of our speaker series by visiting our website at roosevelt.liu.edu. During the presentation, please feel free to type in your questions in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Today's webinar also will, will be made available on our website within a few weeks. Now I would like to introduce my good friend and colleague, Professor Tweed Roosevelt. Thank you, Rita. And hello, everybody. It's great to see so many of you back and welcome to those of you who are new. <clears throat> so has been said, today's subject is TR, the making of a leader. Now, let me first tell you what this is not. Uh, it is not a how-to lecture. Although you may find some useful information here that might become helpful to you, uh, that's not, this is not about that. This is about how TR learned to become a leader, what he learned along the way. So I'm gonna delve in some depth into this very important part of his life. It's a very large subject uh, and I can only give you a sketch. I will look at various points in his life where he faced a situation which taught him some valuable lessons that he could use as he shaped his leadership style. I will tell you a TR story and then explore what he learned and how he learned. I will only cover up to when he mustered out of the Rough Riders and started running for the, uh, for the uh, governor of New York. Uh, and of course he learned more about leadership as governor and as president, but that, that will be uh, taught for another issue, another, another time perhaps. So uh, let's talk about leadership briefly and as a concept. It's a huge issue and it's a fundamental issue to anybody who gets involved in, in dealing with other people. There are articles and books, they abound about this subject. Whole courses are taught it in places that, like uh, the Harvard Law School and many other places. There are even schools that focus on, in fact, the Roosevelt School at LIU uh, will spend, a, a lot of its focus will be on presidential leadership. And of course, there are many books written on the subject about TR's leadership. There are several of them and some of them are quite good. So there's a lot to talk about here. Uh, now, what is leadership? The concept of leadership is really pretty easy to define, but it's hard to get your hands around. Uh, I'm gonna use a very simple definition that works for me and for this talk. It's, it's similar to Dwight D. Eisenhower's uh, definition, and there's a man who knew a lot about leadership. It's very simple. Leadership is to get the ability to get other people to do what you want them to do. Uh, I think we can pretty much all agree on that as a definition, it's simple, but the devil, as they say, are in the details. So my first point here is that there is no best approach to leadership. Every person needs to develop their own style, which fits their own personality and the particular situation in which they find themselves. Uh, developing one's own style, it's a little like building a tower out of stones or perhaps several towers. As you go along in life, you come across a stone that might be useful for you in leadership. You look it over and you put it uh, in, the, in the stack that relates to a particular part of leadership skills. And as you go along, you keep building your little uh, uh, towers of leadership skills. Times you pick up a stone, add it. Sometimes you remove a stone. And eventually over your life, you have a whole edifice of how to go about this very uh, interesting part of your life. Uh, another point I want to emphasize, and uh, this is as important as uh, leadership style, uh, and this is that it's really, leadership style is one thing, but you've got to have the wisdom to know what you're leading towards, where you're going. Uh, after all, 
uh, superb leadership has uh, really, it's worse than useless if it leads in the wrong direction. Uh, if you're leading into the valley of death uh, uh, of the light brigade, it doesn't matter how good your leadership is. So TR's ability to know where to lead, and he was right most of the time, it'll only be touched on here and could be the subject of another talk. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tell you a number of stories that will illustrate lessons TR has learned. This will be nowhere near complete, but I think you'll get a pretty good idea of what he learned. So I wanna talk, uh, start with TR as a boy, uh, rather cute kid, I think. Uh, you, some of you who have been uh, with me in previous lectures may have seen this image, but I, what I wanna focus on here is TR and asthma. And I've talked about this before, but to give you, for those who don't, hadn't heard it, TR had asthma as a kid. Uh, back uh, in when he was a kid, asthma was a very serious disease. Uh, the doctors had little idea of what caused it or what to do about it. Uh, and it was life-threatening. People died of asthma. And TR had a pretty uh, strong version of it, a pretty bad version of it. And he was pretty well decapacitated, incapacitated. His parents... Uh, were, of course, extremely worried. One of the things about this disease is not only does it scare the, the child who has it, it's like drowning, he said once. I don't have asthma, so I don't know, but it's like drowning. You think you're gonna drown at any moment. And it's terrifying to the parents who watch their little kid suffering through this and can do very little about it. Uh, even the doctors were terrified by this. And TR's situation really, uh, he overheard his parents one talking talking about his disease and opining that he probably wouldn't live very long. It must have been a tough thing for TR to do, although when he referred to it later, it didn't seem to have a huge effect on him. In any case, uh, his father particularly tried to do anything he could. Uh, on medical advice, some of the uh, uh, remedies seemed bizarre and maybe even cruel and unusual punishment. For example, it was recommended that TR smoke uh, uh, big cigars as this little kid like this and they poured gallons of coffee down down him and uh, uh, his father at night when TR would wake he often had these attacks at night would wake up and try to get him breathe and one of the things that they do is he'd do his father would do is get the carriage his open carriage and drive TR furiously through the streets trying to force air into his lungs and uh, 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 really not much they could do, did much. Uh, they took him to the country, they took him in various places. In any case, it was a uh, uh, tremendous uh, problem for him. Now, what lessons did he learn from this as a little kid? Well, first of all, I should tell you that his father told him one day, he said, look, son, you've got a weak body, but a great mind. You're gonna have to build up your body. And so he arranged for young boy to go to gyms and he actually built a gym in his house. And TR uh, was uh, exercised furiously, built himself up. And over time, his asthma began to go away. And eventually in his twenties, he had very few uh, episodes. And so what did he learn about this? Well, first he learned that it's important to identify a core problem and then focus on it and do the dogged work that uh, needs to be done to try to correct it. You'll see this over and over again in his leadership. Uh, and TR came to believe that uh, he had overcome this uh, disease by his effort. And uh, he had overcome in what appeared to him and others as insurmountable odds. Now this raises some interesting points. Uh, first thing about leadership is it's, what is important is what you believe, not necessarily what is true. And this is an excellent example for it, yeah, for that. In a way, it doesn't matter what's true. After all, none of us really know what everything is true. We just charge ahead on life. And TR genuinely believed he cured his asthma, but this wasn't true. And I'll take you on a little side uh, tour here. Uh, I was having lunch one time with, with my luncheon partner at the table was this fellow, Dr. Carlos Camajo. Uh, he's a uh, 
emergency physician at Mass General and professor uh, of medicine at Harvard Medical School, but he also specializes in asthma. Now, I had just read David McCullough's book, and he covers TR's asthma, and he comes to the conclusion, based on psychiatric advice he had from various psychiatrists, that TR's asthma was uh, a way to get out of going to church. Now, I just didn't believe that. I knew TR liked going to church in, in his diaries as a kid he talked about. But anyway, I raised this issue with Carlos. And by the end of the lunch, we decided we'd do a research project into this. So he and I, we delved very carefully into all the records, the diaries, the letters and everything, tried to chart every day, every time that TR had an attack and then do statistical analysis. And we came up with, there was no connection to Sunday and church. So we'd done that one. But the, another thing that Carlos said to me, which was even more important in a way, he said, you know, childhood asthma like this generally goes away by itself in late teens or early 20s. Uh, and I believe he's right. And so what that means is that no matter what TR did, uh, he probably still would have self-cured, so to speak. Uh, but he believed that it was his work that did it. And this shaped his whole life for the better, I think, after that. Uh, and he became a role model with kids all around the country who were suffering from disabilities, took his advice uh, and, and did what they could to overcome the problems. It was a tremendous uh, source of for good. And it filled in him this idea that if we just do work hard and do our best, we can overcome anything. Uh, and this profoundly affected him uh, as president and what he did domestically and internationally. It became a very core part of, of his belief about what, how to handle life. Uh, he, even though it wasn't true, it didn't matter. It had great effect on him personally and all the rest of us. In fact, I believe that if he had not taken this approach to his asthma, he might not have been president at all. All right, let's move on to the next one. I've got to keep moving here. Uh, let's talk about TR's father's death. Uh, oops, there he is. TR's father was a huge influence in his life. I've just told you about some of the things he uh, uh, did on the asthma, but he also did other things. He was a philanthropist and he was a problem solver and he started institutions to deal with problems and to move things forward. And he got his, he involved uh, his son intimately in these, even as very young. So just to give you an example, in New York City, there were newspaper boys who sold newspapers. And these were unfortunate kids. Most of them were orphan, orphans. Uh, they lived on the street. They made a miserable income and their life was terrible. Uh, and they were of course victimized, all sorts of things happened. So uh, what, uh, what TR and some of his friends decided to do was to create what they call Newsboys Lodging House, or sort of a safe house where these kids could go and where uh, they could get a, a bath or a wash up where they could stay in beds. It may look rather grim, but this is what the kids faced um, before they had these homes. This is a, one of many great photographs by Jacob Reese. Uh, so uh, TR took his son, I mean, TR was taken by his father to, uh, to the, these houses regularly where they worked, where TR would work at handing out food and doing menial tasks. Uh, and this, this was a whole, it showed him a whole different world. He was raised in a very upper class New York society. And his father wanted to show him that most of the world didn't live like he did. And it was his job to try to help them out. Uh, well, in any case, uh, TR was at Harvard and he came home for Christmas and his father was very ill. Uh, and, uh, but it looked like he got better. TR went back to, back to Harvard, uh, but a few weeks later he was summoned down. He didn't get home in time for his father's death and his father died at, uh, at uh, 40, 46. So TR was devastated. He felt like his pillars of his life had been pulled out of him. Uh, for a while, he couldn't really do much of anything, but he chose to rise above this and his response was to go back to school and work it as hard as he could. And so a lesson from tragedy for him was to focus on the president, on the present and work hard to overcome grief. Now I want to tell you another story. Uh, this is uh, 
uh, about a trip that T.R. took when he was about 13 years old to Moosehead Lake, Lake Maine. It's a simple story. Uh, he was alone on his way up to uh, Maine. This was a, a resort. The air was clear and fresh. It was thought to help him. And he was going to spend some time with his family there. But on the train, two uh, Maynard kids, slightly older than him, managed to get him off to the side and were bullying him. And you know, they could clearly overpower him. He tried very hard to sort of fight back. There was nothing he could do. He just felt completely helpless and humiliated by this. And they kind of teased him and poked him. Well, they didn't hurt him. And then they left him. And the humiliation was profound. Uh, and he determined that he would not let this happen again, that he would uh, uh, do what he could to hone up his fighting skills. And his, his feeling that he was going to be able to deal with this kind of thing, first of all. Second of all, if he looked physically strong, he probably wouldn't be attacked like this. Uh, and so he did. And in fact, as he went on, they were, right, he built his body up tremendously. In any case, you know, what did he learn from this? Well, he learned that you got to stand up for yourself and you got to be self-reliant. And if you can show that you can protect yourself, you can avoid these kinds of things. A different kind of attitude in sort of today's view about victimhood. Uh, I think both are appropriate, but TR had this idea that it was his responsibility to protect himself from this kind of thing. And this guy, this sort of realization that he learned as a 13 year old guided him the rest of his life. He was constantly being uh, focused in his political career and elsewhere by people trying to bully him. And uh, he, he had learned this uh, fighting back thing. It even affected his presidency and his view about the whole country. Uh, he believed that the best way to maintain the peace was to be able to defend yourself if you get attacked. And that meant building up the Navy. I, I gave a whole talk about this earlier, both on international affairs and the Navy. You can see past uh, events, the past talks on our website uh, at roosevelt.lidu.edu. So let's talk about another aspect of his being in Maine. This was a different time. When he was college, he started going up to Maine uh, where uh, there were two Maine guides. Here they are, the two men on the left. That's T.R. on the right with the, with the mus uh, mutton chops. Uh, he looked kind of weedy there. They, they were only a couple of years older than he, but they were tremendously accomplished outdoorsmen. They were lumberjacks, they were woodmen, they knew the forest intimately. Uh, and T.R. really admired, almost hero worshipped them. And this was important uh, for him later on because this was his first chance to get to know and respect sort of ordinary Americans and for their abilities for what they could do and where they could go. Uh, and another lesson he learned up there had to do with big game. He, was, he started his big game hunting there. Here's some examples. These, this and the experience of being outdoors uh, created some pretty dangerous situations at various times. He found himself in, in tough situations, getting lost, getting put in the river, you know, all kinds of things, being uh, facing these beasts. Um, and so he began to experience fear. And his approach about fear, how you deal about fear, it's interesting. I mean, can, uh, later he's he opined on this. He said, you know, the best way to deal with fear is if you're afraid, just pretend you're not afraid and charge ahead, charge ahead. And eventually uh, you won't be afraid. And he used that approach at all kinds of places in his life. It was a very, very useful thing. Uh, so now let's look at his time as a state legislature. He was 23 when he um, was elected to the New York City State Legislature as an assemblyman. And he was a typical 23 year old. First of all, well, he was not typical in the sense that he looked like a dandy. I mean, look at his hair parted more or less down the middle. This was not what most state legislators looked and they were a rough and tumble group, uh, all different kinds of people. And uh, he was not particularly impressed with them when he first arrived and they certainly weren't impressed with him. They thought he was this rich dandy. They called him Oscar Wilde among other things. And uh, that, uh, you know, pampered kid would, he wouldn't, wouldn't last very long, wouldn't be able to do anything. And, uh, uh, he, on, for his part, he thought he had the answer to everything. He thought he could just 
browbeat everybody into doing exactly what he wanted and everything would be fine. Uh, well, of course it wasn't that way, but he did begin to get the uh, 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 sort of admiration of his fellow assemblymen because of a number of things. One, he continued, get into the details. Every chance he got, he tried to learn as much as he could about whatever the bill was. So for example, when there was a bill about the cigar makers living in tenements in the, on the Lower East Side of New York, he went down and visited them and, and did everything he could to understand the situation. And this began to uh, raise his stock in his uh, fellow legislators' eyes. Uh, so uh, he, 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 he also clearly exhibited a real concern about the needs of ordinary people and, and the legislators like that too. So uh, he had, he, in fact, he, uh, he was elected to a second term and then was made minority leader, the youngest ever minority leader, he was Republican, of course, youngest minority leader in the, uh, in the House showed that his fellow legislators were beginning to accept him. So he learned a number of things here. He learned uh, the need to balance and he learned a very important beginning of a very important lesson is that you have to focus on what you can achieve. So it doesn't do any good to fight for something if you're not gonna get anything there and be practical and be true to yourself, but you have to compromise to do things. And the biggest lesson I think was you can't do it alone. You need allies. And sometimes your allies come from unusual places. Uh, let's move on over. Yes, I should have shown you that before. That's the first cartoon ever done of TR. He's in the legislature and he's sort of driving out some of the bad guys. And he's dressed as a policeman, which was really interesting because, of course, later he became police commissioner. And we'll talk about that. Uh, I want to talk briefly about uh, his wife and mother's death. I've mentioned this, of course, in other talks. It's well known. He was a legislator at the time. He got uh, word that Alice, his wife there on the left, had just given birth to their first child, and it was a little baby girl, and he was he decided that he would wait a little bit, finish what he had to do in, uh, in, for that week in, in uh, Albany, and come down to New York. He then got a telegram telling him things had turned for the worse. To make a long story short, he got home just in time to be with his wife uh, and his mother. They were in the same house. He with his wife when she died, and then a few hours later when his mother died. They both died in the same house on the same day, if you will believe it, on Valentine's Day. This, as you can imagine, was an enormous blow uh, to T.R. Uh, it, it, the whole city saw this and went into mourning. This is just a short article. There are many articles in the newspapers. Even the New York le State Legislature went into recess and some people came down. The funeral, there was a double funeral at the Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church in New York. TR seemed almost, you know, non compass mentis as he was in there. And then they buried them both uh, in Greedwood Cemetery in, uh, in Brooklyn. Uh, TR uh, was devastated. This is all he could bring himself to write in his little diary. The light has gone out of my life. Friends of his were worried that maybe he was uh, uh, going to commit suicide. And he really didn't know what he was doing for a while. But he pulled himself back together again uh, and went back to the state legislature and just buried himself in work. Uh, and, and, and then went out west, which I'll address in a minute. Uh, he clearly learned some things from this, aside from the obvious of the impermanence of life. Uh, this idea of when you face situations like this, furious work helps and look forward, don't look back. Uh, and so uh, he said uh, of his hard work on this subject, he said, uh, black care rarely follows the writer whose pace is fast enough. So now having mentioned the West, uh, let's, uh, hmm. there we go. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the West. Here is how TR envisioned himself. This is a drawing taken from a photo he had done uh, in a studio in New York, I think it was. 
Now that's what he liked to think he looked like, but this is probably as the cowboys saw them. Now remember, T.R. owned a ranch. He was a rancher, not a cowboy. In other words, he was the boss, not the workers. The cowboys were the workers. But they took one look at this and didn't know what to make of it. Uh, here was this dude from the East, a skinny little kid uh, who liked to dress up in fancy dress. Uh, and worst of all, wore glasses. And if you wore glasses, it was a sign of moral turpitude. And so he had his work cut out for him of establishing his place out here. Uh, and I'll tell you, there are lots of stories, uh, but I'll tell you a couple of them that'll give you some kind of an idea. Let's start with the Mingusville Bully, as it's known as. Mingusville was a town that uh, town's hardly what it was. It had practically, you know, four or five buildings, one of which was a saloon hotel in it. It was in the middle of the Montana prairie, about 30 miles from TR's ranch. And he wound up there one evening, he was looking for lost cattle or horses. And he goes into the, into the saloon, which is also the upstairs is the uh, hotel. Hotel, don't get the wrong impression. The hotel was one big open room with a whole rows of beds. And he went in and claimed any bed uh, that was available. And if no bed was available, you just shared one with somebody else. Well, in any case, as he went into the bar, there was this drunk cowboy. And he had a six shooter in each hand and he was doing the kind of thing you see, you know, in Western movies, shooting up the bar, maybe the mirror, maybe this or that. And in the bar, as TR noted later when he wrote about this, uh, there were several uh, cowboys around sitting with that kind of smile, he said, on their faces that you have when you're not seeing anything funny at all, but you're trying to look uh, sort of harmless. Uh, well, TR went in and uh, he sat down sort of behind a, uh, a pot-bellied stove and uh, sort of ho hoped he would stay out of sight. Well, this guy saw him right away, of course, and began in taunting TR and calling him four eyes. So they called people with glasses, four eyes. Now uh, you're gonna do this and you're gonna do that. And TR kept trying to sort of stay out of trouble. Uh, but at some point it became clear this wasn't going to work. And so uh, the guy said, and Four Eyes is going to buy everybody drinks. And so TR stood up. He said he noticed that the uh, bully's uh, legs or feet were together. So he stood up and he said, if I have to, I have to. And then he wound up and gave an enormous punch to this guy in the nose, uh, knocked him cold. And in the process, he shot off his two guns. He wasn't probably trying to shoot anybody and out he went. So. Uh, the others dragged him off with great relief and, and the evening went on. Uh, I think TR from this incident uh, learned a number of things, of course, that we've talked to, underlined what we've talked about otherwise. But another one is don't bluff. Don't bluff. If you stand up, you have to do it, do it. Don't bluff. Uh, and that stood him instead all through his life, including when he was president. In another lecture that I gave on TR and foreign policy, I talked about how he had to convince the Kaiser that he wasn't washing. So now let's go talk to another aspect of, of TR's Western life. Uh, and one of the major things that happened was the roundup. Now remember, this is open ranch, uh, open open ranch ranch or open, open ranching where your cattle uh, want, uh, roam free on the, uh, on the prairies and the grasslands around there. And once or twice a year, all the ranches would get bring in their cowboys and they would round up the entire herd and uh, then do the things they had to do, uh, uh, brand the young calves, castrate them, take ones for the market, whatever that had to be done. Uh, and this was tough, long, arduous work. Uh, it lasted several weeks uh, and all kinds of weather, very dangerous situations. Uh, and TR went on them. First thing he's, he went for the, as much as he could for the whole time. And his approach was to show everybody basically that he was willing to do everything that any of the others would do, no matter how mundane or how dangerous. And an example of a dangerous situation is if a sudden storm came up, uh, this is a Remington uh, painting, by the way. If a sudden storm came up uh, and the cattle stampeded, 
It was an extremely dangerous situation, but it was also, you know, they could get scattered everywhere. You had to start all over again. So all you could do is ride aside them and somebody would ride in front and try to stop. And eventually he'd stop them. TR was always there. And whenever he could, he took the most dangerous place. At one time he was in the saddle for 40 hours, only coming back to the, the little camp to trade horses. And so this, uh, the, the cowboys noticed and they knew, they saw that he was really willing to work hard and to do what he could to pull his own weight and also to help them, whatever they had to do. Uh, and so that was a valuable lesson for TR that, you know, in leadership, you've got to show that you don't ask anybody to do something you won't do and you do anything they do and you'll do it for better or longer. Now he had another problem here though, but he was, he was a, a rancher. In other words, he was the boss. And so the boss can't be, you know, totally equal and friends with the, with the sort of the regular workers. And the way he solved that problem there, or at least partially solved it, was he insisted on being called Mr. Roosevelt. Nobody else was called Mr. Mr. Roosevelt. And that was enough to draw the line so that he could uh, be part of the group, but separate from it. Uh, so let's now move on to another incident. When he came back from the West, New York City uh, was having a mayoral race. And TR, remember, was a Republican. Uh, the Democratic candidate, Abraham Hewitt, the man on the left, a very distinguished guy, but he was Tammany Hall's man, you know, the corrupt uh, power broker Tammany Hall, although he was a relatively honest and a good man, but still he was the tool of the Tammany bosses. Uh, he was running for the Republican side and it was pretty clear he was gonna win. Uh, they, there was a third party candidate in this race, a guy named George, the fellow with the beard, the last name George, the fellow uh, uh, with the beard is Henry George is his name, uh, with the beard in the middle. He was an independent and he uh, was really a the progressive before there were progressives. He was a firebrand. He believed in a single tax to try to deal with the disparity of income. And he was a firebrand. He spoke, you know, and shook his fist and did all sorts of things. But the Republicans wanted somebody to run and they picked, picked TR. They figured he was a good sacrificial lamb. Uh, and TR was willing to go in. I mean, he knew it was unlikely he was going to win. But actually, when the race started, he thought he had a chance. But he said, as long as I come in second, it's OK. I just don't want to come in third. Well, the, when the election came, he did come in third, uh, which was quite a blow to him. And uh, you know, he learned various lessons from this. One is, even though George was a firebrand, his the actual policies he wanted were similar to TR's of dealing with the downtrodden to try to have these progressive agenda is what it became called later. Uh, and so, you know, they split the vote in that and TR kind of realized that you could find help from people, even if all their characteristics you didn't agree with, it was firebrand nature and the sort of things that George said. Uh, so that was one lesson. Uh, and uh, another really was that realistically, this was a, uh, uh, a Pyrrhic war, a Pyrrhic battle, you know, he wasn't going to win it. And he had to reevaluate himself as when do you decide to go into something to curry to your party and the power uh, and uh, but where you're going to be humiliated. And he learned this, this was a very important lesson. He learned that it's okay to pick your battles. It's okay to pick the fights that you have some chance of winning but don't fight Pyrrhic battles when there's no chance of winning. Uh, and this shaped his approach to how he was a leader in the White House. TR approached the White House with this very much in mind. He knew he only had a certain amount of political capital. He picked five or six or seven things he could do. And what he picked them on, they might be stretch targets, but they were things he thought he could achieve before he'd used up all his capital. And so conservation was an example of that and other things. Uh, so he learned a very important lesson, even though he lost. And, 
In another situation, that was a presidential election year in 1884, there was a fellow named Blaine from Maine, Blaine from Maine, was running, uh, was, was a candidate at the uh, Republican convention and TR was, went to the convention. Uh, this guy, he may look pretty good, but the press and the public had a very different view about him. Here are two cartoons uh, on the left. There is, uh, you can just see the shoes of the Democratic candidates standing on a terrific platform. And there's Blaine fussing around, uh, not making much of a platform and, and not really, you can't read what it says on the, on the different planks. And he was just, you know, really all about Blaine. And on the right is a cartoon of Blaine uh, as a con man. He's doing what's called the shell game, uh, which is very, you know, it's a con game, very like the three card Monty, I think it's called, and two voters standing there. So he was mistrusted and he, he had a very sketchy past where he'd taken money at various times. Uh, so TR uh, favored another candidate, but eventually the convention chose Blaine. And so TR was confronted with the problem of, do I stick with Blaine or do I uh, uh, bolt the party? And he decided to stick with Blaine and he got into terrible trouble with his backers then uh, because he didn't stand up to principle. And from that, he learned that it's important to stand up to, for principle, even if you may think it will end your career. And several times, many times actually in his life, he did things for principle that he thought ended his career, but the people loved him for it because they thought he was an honest man. They might not always agree with him. But they thought he was an honest man and he continued to get elected again and again. Let's go now to the police commissionership. And I'll do this quickly. Uh, TR was police commissioner. He, was, he came into a very demoralized, unprofessional, corrupt police department. Uh, this is a cartoon of him coming in to clean up, clean it up. On the right is a police badge from the time of TR. I had some of those made for a uh, event I did. We all, everybody loved getting a sort of a replica. Any case, TR started out, he knew he had to deal with the problem of this demoralized and basically corrupt patrolmen. And so he wanted to get them first. So he came in and what he would do is late at night, he would wander the streets. Here he is, this is from a, a a graphic novel, an excellent graphic novel, this graphic, anyway. And he would confront policemen on the beat who were doing something they shouldn't be doing, like sleeping here or in a bar, and insist they come to his office the next day and a line of them would show up with knees shaking and he would met out punishment. And it wasn't long before he got respect from the patrolman. And then he took on the officer, so to speak. This is a famous guy who's an inspector of an area called the Tenderloin, the worst section of New York. He was known as Clubber Williams. So, uh, he, he, the Clubber part obviously came from the police uh, baton. And he was a real believer in using the Clubber. He once said, more justice comes out of a police baton than out of the Supreme Court. Uh, he was also corrupt. So TR took on people like this and got them and either got them fired or got them in line. Uh, then he thought, looked at promotions there and he wanted to promote because of merit, not political uh, connections or money. Before he came in, the way you got into the police department is you paid Tammany Hall a fairly stiff fee. And if you wanted to get promoted, you paid more fee. And certain groups were entirely uh, uh, kept out. And so this fellow is an interesting fellow. He's, uh, he's a, uh, he was an Italian American. He started out as a uh, uh, street sweeper. In those days, the police can, oh, took charge of street sweeping. His name was Giuseppe Petrosino. And he started out as a street sweeper through raw talent. He got appointed as a, as a patrolman, but he was never gonna get any further. But TR recognized uh, talent and promoted him. And he had a terrific career. Uh, and then TR got delved into the details. So uh, one of the things he did was uh, there was no sort of education for policemen, no police education. So he created the police academy, first police academy in the world. And that's what New York's police academy looks like today. Uh, in, in those days, police bought their own weapons and they got the cheapest malfunctioning one they could. He standardized the weapons with the Colt 38. 
uh, he, uh, you couldn't communicate with policemen on the beat. So he established this uh, police uh, call box concept. It was the one to, of his time is on the left. This is a modern one on the right. And the way this worked was uh, uh, A, the citizens could call in on it and B, police had to call in various times to tell their uh, bosses where they were. It was another way of controlling. He also created uh, the first mobile police force, which was bicycles. And it was an elite force, high, very high morale. And they still, still exist today. Uh, so what did he learn? Well, first, you have to change the culture of an organization starting at the top. And you had to know the details in and out. And you had to forget about prejudice and judge people individually, individually utilizing their talents. And uh, then finally, his failure. One of the major things he wanted to do uh, was to uh, strangle the money, the, all this money that was going uh, to Tammany Hall. One of the major areas where bars were closed on Sunday by law, uh, but they could open if they paid Tammany Hall through the police. And TR wanted to strangle them off. And so he mounted a huge campaign to close the bars. Well, it failed. It was one of his failures. And uh, uh, the people just didn't like it. And uh, he, he lost that battle. Uh, what did he learn? He learned that if you're facing a situation what you need in a political policy situation, what you need is the people behind you. And uh, he didn't get that in New York. He didn't explain to the people why he wanted to close the bars and they didn't want to have their bars on Sunday. He didn't explain to them that all they had to do was change the law and uh, he would be perfectly satisfied. So that was a major lesson for him later. Let's talk about his time as Secretary of the under, of Assistant Secretary of the Navy. He came in, his boss, the secretary, was this fellow uh, who, uh, Long is his name, he, uh, Secretary Long, he was a nice old guy, sort of at the end of his career, he's exactly what you see there, sort of at the end of his career. And TR wanted to change everything. He knew war was coming and he needed to prepare the Navy for the coming war with Spain. And sure enough, it did come. Uh, so what he would do it with Long, Long was not a particularly hard work. He was happy to leave all the details to TR. He liked to go on long vacations and take days off. And TR would encourage him. Long would go up to Massachusetts in the summer for vacation. TR would write him letters telling him some of what he was doing and uh, uh, saying you ought to stay, stay longer, stay longer, he'd say. The same thing would happen uh, on a day, you know. Long came into the office and then he'd go off in the afternoon to visit his corn doctor or whatever. And uh, TR would encourage him to do that because when Long was out of the office, TR was uh, the acting secretary and he could do things. So one of the things he did is try to get around him really capable people. Uh, this is Alfred Thayer Mahan, the great Navy strategist. He promoted and, and nurtured his career. Here is uh, Dewey at the time, Captain Dewey. TR discovered him. He was not by any means the highest level uh, Navy officer, but he really he knew this man had talent and he knew this was the right man to send out to uh, the Asiatic fleet, which would uh, fight the Spanish uh, fleet in the Philippines if it came to war. And, but the problem was that he wasn't near the top of the list. And in fact, there were other people above him on the list who had very good political support from uh, senators and, and even the president and, and from Secretary Long. So what TR did is he waited until Long was out of the office one day and then appointed him and sent him off to, to the Asiatic fleet. And when Long came back, he did a bunch of other things that day too. When Long came back, he was confronted with all these things that TR did and he was pretty angry about it. He, ranted and raved against TR and TR said, oh, I'm terribly sorry. I shouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. Blah, blah. And Long, you know, sort of ripped him up and down and then sent him back to his office, but he didn't change the appointments. So that's sort of an example. So what do you learn? Uh, A, uh, back talented people and do what you can for them and be as close to them as you can. B, manage up, manage your boss. So always think about what's the best way to manage for boss, your boss. And third, don't ask for permission, ask for forgiveness. And uh, that worked very well for him and for the country and for his future. 
So now let's go to the Rough Riders. Uh, uh, I'll talk a little about TR in Cuba. We, you know, we've got this whole long story. I've given talks about it before, but I just want to talk about two stories here to begin with. One is beans. So here's the situation. Uh, they just fought the first battle at Guasianas, and uh, a number of troopers had been killed there. It was a fierce and you know, very vigorous battle. And uh, they were getting ready to go on to San Juan Hill. Uh, here you can see, you know, they're, they're looking at food and so on and checking their equipment. Uh, problem was the quartermasters were doing a lousy job of getting food to the troops and the Rough Riders were suffering. Well, TR heard that way back behind the lines on the beach, uh, there was a depot that was rumored to have some beans. Uh, so he, uh, they got a couple of troopers and they marched all the way back a long way and very, it wasn't easy marching around in the jungle there where it was really hot, steamy insects and enemy troops and so on. Anyway, eventually he got back uh, to where the stockpile was and the guy in charge of it was called a commis commissar. Uh, and he said, well, do you have any beans? And the commissar, yes, I have 1,100 pounds of beans. And TR demanded all of them. And the commissar looked a little quizzical. And then he said, well, he couldn't do that because the beans were designated for the officer's mess. Well, TR thought, knew he, thought, had, thought he knew how to deal with that after years in the civil service, he's dealing with this bureaucratic mindset. So he goes out of the tent and a few minutes later, he comes back in and he returns saying that he wanted the 1,100 pounds of beans for his officers. And TR later uh, recorded what happened then. So the commissioner, our commissar, I mean, but your officers cannot eat 1,100 pounds of beans. And TR said, you don't know the appetites my officers have. And the commissar demurring it, it said, well, I have to send a requisition to Washington. TR, all right, only give me the beans. Commissar, I'm afraid they'll take it out of your salary, TR. That'll be all right, only give me the beans. So he got the beans and the troopers helped him carry it back. And you can imagine, of course, that uh, uh, all the troopers heard about this uh, very quickly. Uh, another issue is his horse. Now remember, these are cavalry, but they, had, they were dismounted. They had to leave their horses back uh, in the United States. The only one that had horses was TR and he had two of them. Uh, and when they were marching through the jungle, which they did for several days in terrible conditions, TR refused to ride his horse. He walked his horse um, along with the men. But when they got to San Juan Hill, this is a Remington, what famous Remington penny of it. When they got to San Juan Hill, TR mounted in the charge. This is the famous charge up the hill. Uh, he mounted uh, and there he is in front going forward. Uh, well, what, what, what can we say about this? What we can say is TR by walking the horse, being with his men, showing them he would do whatever they did. Uh, and he only rode the horse when it's important symbolically and in fact placed him in great danger because only the densest of uh, Cuban soldiers would know the first person to shoot is the guy on the horse. And of course, all the men knew that too. So he knew how to use, uh, 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 sort of the accoutrements of power in ways that just didn't make him feel good, but was part of his leadership style. Uh, so, and, and by the way, uh, you know, the general story is that he said, uh, uh, charge, you know, to go up the hill. But in fact, that's not what he said. He said what every soldier wants to hear from their senior officer. He said, follow me. So, sort of in conclusion, I've, I've made a whole bunch of points here. I think you get some idea of how TR learned his leadership and how he used it. We could go on at some, at some length on this subject. Uh, but now I will close with another story. And this is a little different than, than the other story because it's not about how he learned the leadership, but it's really, I guess, uh, sort of the fruits of good leadership. Anyway, the war was over, the soldiers were, uh, in uh, uh, taken back to Montauk, uh, Wyckoff it was called, where they were in quarantine. 
and they were there uh, for, I don't know, several weeks, I think. And they were getting ready to muster out on this day. And Tier uh, was in his tent uh, writing letters. And he knew in about an hour or so the muster outing ceremony, the end of the whole thing would happen. And he's in his tent and a couple of troopers come in and say to him, uh, would you step, no, sir, would you step outside? We, we want to say something. So he stepped outside of his tent and there was lined up the entire regiment. Now maybe 800 of them left. And in front of them was this little table with a, something on it with a blanket on it. And uh, a trooper, trooper, not an officer, a trooper uh, stood up and started. Uh, he began a speech and the speech sort of choking up. He, he said that the troopers of the first voluntary cavalry wish to present their commanding officer with a very slight token of admiration, love, and esteem. And so Murphy struggled on fighting back tears as were many of the other troopers, retelling some of the reasons why they admired TR so much. He wound up, in conclusion, allow me to say that one and all from the highest to the lowest will carry back in their hearts a pleasant remembrance of your acts for they have always been of the kindness. At this point, the blanket was pulled apart and revealed Remington's bucking bronco of bronze. Uh, TR was stunned uh, and de obviously deeply touched. It was a while before he could talk, something that didn't, <laughs> it was not usual for TR. I really don't know what to say, he started, but then he got his stride. Nothing could possibly happen that would touch and please me as this. I would have been much deeply, most deeply touched if the officers had given me this testimonial. But coming from you, my men, I appreciate it tenfold. It comes to me from you who shared the hardships of the campaign with me, who gave me a piece of your hard tech when I had none, and who gave me your blankets when I had none to lie on. So this gift comes from this particular American regiment and it touches me more than I can say. This is something I'll hand down to my children. And he did. There was many a tear to be seen and he said, all right, I want everybody to line up. I wanna shake their hands. Uh, and so they all lined up. Uh, and by this time he had learned the name of every single soldier in the unit, all thousand of them. And he shook each hand, called them by their name, told a little anecdote or tale uh, that he remembered about them. Uh, and they all mild marched by. Uh, in fact, um, they stood by him the rest of his life. They came to his, uh, when he was running for office and they provided honor guards and all sorts of things. And in fact, when he's in the White House, uh, been elected president, he was he instructed the doorman to immediately admit anyone who said he was a rough rider, no matter how disreputable looking. So he paid it back. And on that note, I'm going to turn it over to the Q and A. Thank you, Rita. thank you, Professor Roosevelt. Wonderful presentation. Uh, in the short time we have left, um, we do have a number of questions that have come in. Uh, uh, the first is uh, the Remington's bronze statue that you just showed. Where is that located? Where can we see that? Well, he took it home to Sagamore Hill uh, and where kids played with it. Even I played with it as a kid uh, in my time at Sagamore Hill. And it's still there. So if you want to go and see it, go to Long Island, his long-term home. It's called Sagamore Hill and Oyster Bay. It's currently closed, but I think any minute will be opening and it's worth seeing. Wonderful. Um, this is a question that came in from Gene. He asks, did Theodore Roosevelt's bare knuckled fist fights on weekends add to his leadership qualities? <laughs> I suppose you're talking about in the White House and it is true indeed. It wasn't just on the weekends. Uh, he, he had a gym built in the, in the basement of the White House and he used to box there often with, uh, with his military aides. And some, even Sullivan, the great uh, heavyweight champion boxed with him and later said, you know, I mean, Sullivan could obviously annihilate TR. Said I held back a little bit, but for a while I was in a little bit of trouble. So TR uh, 
did it basically for exercise, but I think the word got out, he was willing to defend himself. There's an interesting side story. One of his military aides, who as, was a distant cousin of TR actually, uh, hit him in the eye and it blinded him in his one eye. Uh, he never told the aide, uh, in fact, wouldn't tell anybody until later, uh, but he had to give up, by his doctor forced him to give up boxing, so he took up jujitsu and was throwing around giant people in the basement. Next question. <laughs> Do you think that TR was consciously aware of the process of learning leadership skills or did they just happen naturally for him? No, he was, well, I mean, they didn't call it leadership skills in those days, but uh, he, uh, uh, he was a lifelong learner. He, he thought you never should stop learning there's so much to know. And whatever job he took on, whether it was civil service commissioner, or police department, whatever it was, he tried to learn as much as he could, both from books and from uh, actual experience, from interviewing people, from getting down into the weeds, even at one point going down and shoveling coal with the stokers in the base in the in a mil a Navy ship. Uh, he also read uh, every book he could find and brought that information to what he did. He, he clearly thought about his leadership style. He wouldn't have thought, as I say, in those terms, but it, it, he knew this was very important to him and he tried to learn as much as he could in any way he could. He wasn't shy at all about asking people for help. He wasn't shy at all about showing that he didn't know. When, when he went to San Antonio and one of his jobs was to drill the troops, he didn't know you know, he'd never had no military experience. He didn't know how to drill troops. He kind of made a mess of it the first day. So that night after Reveille, after every, I mean, after taps, everybody asleep, uh, he's in his tent screaming orders back and forth, you know, practicing this. And of course the other soldiers could hear it. Uh, so he wasn't ashamed to show what he didn't know and show that he was working. And that of course showed that he was continually working after they had gone to bed. Next. Um, I know we don't have much time, but I did, did want to ask this question on behalf of Stephen. Uh, who was the true leader in TR's family? Was it TR or his wife? <laughs> Very good question. Uh, those of us who are married know the truth to that thing. You might not admit it, but certainly it was his wife. His wife had a lot better judgment about uh, many things than TR had, and she could control him. He would, uh, you know, for example, he might get carried away at a dinner and be saying so much and she would just look at him, tap her finger on the table and say, now Theodore, it's statements like that that get you into trouble. And he would immediately, you know, accept. Uh, she of course knew, he knew nothing about finances and he wasn't a very good judge of people and she was. So uh, it's not really an answer of who controlled, they both controlled and they controlled their own regions. Next. Okay, I'll, I'll ask the final question and then I know you have some things you'd like to share with the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, the final question is, who was the one leader who you think TR admired more than any other? Uh, that's an easy answer, Abraham Lincoln. TR had tremendous admiration for Abraham Lincoln, studied all he could about him and in some ways followed him. So other than his father, who he thought was the greatest man he'd ever seen and the only man he ever feared. Uh, but as a leader, Abraham Lincoln was it. He thought that his leadership style uh, was fabulous. And he didn't model himself after him, but you know, he, he, he thought about him frequently. Both his father, he, when he was in the White House and had to make great decisions, he said, you know, I, I think about what my father would do and I think about what Abraham Lincoln would do. So on that, let me just say a few final things before I let you all go. Uh, this is the last of the sessions for this academic year. We will start up again in the fall uh, in September with more Tales of TR. During the summer at the Hutton House Lecture Series, I'll be doing three sessions on the three rows of one each on the three Roosevelt's, FDR, TR, and uh, Eleanor. The Roosevelt, as a Roosevelt School, the Roosevelt School's pillars are those three. And uh, they will be uh, focused primarily on the uh, controversies and failures of the two, it's essentially lessons learned is here. And so that 
will start. The first one will be on June 3rd, uh, at, uh, which will be on TR. And you can go to liu.edu slash uh, Hutton, Hutton, H-U-T-T-O-N, and find out more about it. I hope you'll join us then. Uh, I want to say that the Roosevelt School is up and going. We'll have our first, uh, have our start in September. We're looking for our first students, uh, and we're very much anxious to have students. If you know anybody who's interested in international affairs, undergraduate level, international affairs, and public policy, we are accepting students and faculty. We're building up our faculty. Uh, the, uh, the Society of Presidential Descendants, which is also part of the Institute and the school, uh, will have a book prize for the best book on presidential uh, leadership. Uh, and that will be on October 20th in New York City. And it's open to you all and hope you will come. Uh, and finally, uh, these are expensive things to present. So I urge you, I beg you, I feel like one of those beggars on NPR. I beg you to go to uh, roosevelt.liu.edu, click the donate button and just give something, anything will do. So I really thank you all for sticking with me here and I look forward to seeing you again in hopefully this summer on June 3rd and if not uh, in the fall. So all have a good summer and I think we're gonna open up here and be able to go out and enjoy ourselves finally. So thank you and see you next time.